Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 71 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm here with my partner, Hervez Ahmed. Hey, Zaki. Uh, welcome back, listeners. I uh, feel like it's been a while. Not it, only have it, I not. It has been a while. Yeah, not only have we not recorded, I haven't even seen you in a while, which yeah. is, for us is pretty rare. We've finally worked out our issues. <laughs> This is the first lots and step. lots of therapy. This is healing. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm really excited to be back, and uh, I am super excited about our guest today. Yes, we are joined today by Dr. Ali Atai, who has been involved in interfaith activities for over 15 years. He's been a guest lecturer and guest instructor at several colleges and universities, including Cal Poly State, UC Davis, UC Berkeley, UCLA, Cal State East Bay, and others. He studied various Islamic sciences with local San Francisco Bay Area scholars and is a graduate of the Badr Arabic Language Institute in Hadramaut, Yemen, and studied at the prestigious Dar al Mustafa, also in Hadramaut, under some of the most eminent scholars in the world. He holds a PhD in Islamic Biblical Hermeneutics from the Graduate Theological Union and is a professor of Arabic, Quran, and Comparative Theologies at Zaytuna College, the first accredited Muslim college in North America. Dr. Atai, thank you so much for coming on our show. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, so I mean, we are thrilled. And so there's so much to talk about. But um, as we often like to do with uh, our guest is um, to talk about where your origin story begins and where your roots are. Uh, right here in the Bay or elsewhere? Uh, well, I was actually born in Iran. So I'm Iranian. I'm that rare species of the Iranian Sunni. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we came over in 79 during the uh, tumultuous revolution. Right. Uh, so I grew up in the Bay Area. Okay. Been here ever since. Um, and uh, Do you remember uh, I don't remember life anything. in Iran? Or no, it's, it's, it's not in my frontal lobes okay. at least. It may be somewhere back there buried. And, and uh, why did your family land in the Bay? Any, any particular reason? Or uh, my father had a brother that okay. lived in the Bay Area okay. for a while, so we came we came straight to San Ramon in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, so I grew up here, went to elementary school and high school in San Ramon. Um, wasn't practicing uh, Muslim at all. There was no there was no Islam emphasized in my family at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, very secular. Um, uh, and I remember in elementary school, I think my sister and I were the only non-whites in our entire elementary school, if I'm remembering it correctly. Wow. I don't remember anyone else, any other person of color in our entire school. Um, there might have been, I just don't remember. Right. Uh, and so, um, you know, I get that question. It was during the 80s, obviously, so this is, you know, the, the time of Khomeini and Iran-Contra and whatnot, and I get a lot of questions from people. So. My tactic was just to deny, you know, I'm, I'm actually, you know, my sister had this whole thing about we're half Italian and <laughs> half, half Latino and things like that. So I had to keep up with her story. Oftentimes they would, they would come to me to, to check her story. And then I'd, and I'd be like, well, whatever she says, you know. <laughs> you have to compare notes at the start of the day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Make so, sure the stories line yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. So I actually remember in fifth grade, right. um, a very, a very uh, religious student in my class a uh, very Christian, mm-hmm. approached me and said, are you Muslim? And I just remember my heart sinking, and I, and I said, no, and I, and, I, and I wasn't. I didn't identify as Muslim. Right. But then he said, but your name is Arabic. And I'm like, oh, man, this guy knows his stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, uh, no, I actually converted out. And he said, to what? And I said, Mormonism, because I had actually attended a Mormon Sunday school for a couple of years. Because some of my friends at, at, that, at that elementary school were yeah. Mormon, and they invited me to their Sunday school, and I used to go there and you know, kind of just hang out with them. But, so I said, I'm Mormon. And then he said, uh, I don't think you're allowed to convert out of a religion. And I just remember being just so bothered by that. And, and then he said, let me ask the other. So there's another sort of biblical scholar amongst the fifth graders. <laughs> I know, I was saying this. <laughs> fifth grader took religion very seriously. Yeah, so I yeah. remember I remember he was walking over to her and, she, and he asked her, are you allowed to convert out of a religion? And she said, of course. And I said, oh, thank God, you know, they, they don't think I'm Muslim. So I didn't actually identify as Muslim until um, probably ninth grade when I actually saw the movie Malcolm X. Wow. It was on November 18th, 1992. I remember the exact day. And for some strange reason, my father wanted to see this movie. Mm. And, you know, growing up again, there was no religion. Now, now my parents are, you know, they're practicing. They're Shia and they went to Hajj and whatnot. My father's a very accomplished poet. And mm. uh, so, but back then there was nothing. 
Right. So he said, let's go watch this movie, Malcolm X, a Spike Lee movie, a Denzel Washington. Of, of course. course. So it was on a Wednesday, and I remember I went there, and uh, you know, I was, you know, I'm still kind of young. I'm just about to turn 15, I think. Yeah, just about to turn 15. And uh, um, for the most part, I was bored, and you know, but then the 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 Hajj scenes really had an effect on me. Hmm. And then just hearing the Adhan, there's a scene where just the Adhan playing, and then he recites the Fatiha. I think it was actually Denzel yeah. who recited it. That's right. And uh, I, I think just it's had this filmed in the Blue Mosque or something. Yeah, in fact, right? Or yeah, I yeah. believe so. I think it was the Blue Mosque. And I just had this weird sort of experience sitting there. It was kind of a combination of sort of uh, like shame, like you know, why don't I know this? And you know, I'm 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 Persian or Iranian. We prefer Persian. And it's less, you know, in Monster Brani, he has that bit where it's, it's, it's less violent. I'm a Persian cat, you know, meow, rather than Iranian, because it sounds like Iraq. And anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was just full of, it was, there was shame. There was a little bit yeah. of pride. There was a little bit of, you know, it was a weird emotion. Mm -hmm. So then I, I went to the Santa Monica Library and I checked out, because I sat through the entire credits and there were long credits and they had all these celebrities with like X hats on, like Michael Jordan, Janet Jackson. And at the very end of the credits, they actually show a picture of the autobiography of Malcolm X hmm. yeah. as told to Alex Haley. Mm -hmm. So I, I looked at that and I went to the Santa Monica Library and I checked out the book. And of course, you know, I started to read it, I got bored, so I went right to the Hajj uh, chapter. <laughs> so I read that and you know, I read his letter from Mecca and oh, yeah. huh. just had a profound effect on me. Right. So at that point, I remember I decided to call myself Muslim. Wow, that's amazing! You know, so it's yeah, it's amazing. You know, we because we, we've had so many guests on the show. We've heard similar stories. Like yeah, this. but I mean, more so with the autobiography itself than the movie. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, we can just name off a, a list of people like uh, Dr. Omar comes to mind, Dr. Right. Esan Bagby that's comes true. to mind, uh, and others who. Uh, that well, autobiography it's, it's, it's has such an It's almost like a generation. It is. That's what I'm saying. Because, because whether the the book or the film or the film, right? I, yeah. I mean, I I often, I often wonder how many how many people whose journey to Islam does Spike Lee get to get like yeah. the Ajar for? You know, like <laughs> yeah, that's right. inadvertently yeah. he couldn't. Yeah. you know, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's quite amazing. <laughs> yeah, and it all goes back to Malcolm. I mean, regardless, yeah. right? Whether it's the autobiography or the movie. Yeah. Um, no, I was curious. I mean, something you talk about, like, would you say that your experiences of your family migrating here represented or are representative of a lot of the people who fled in 79 from Iran and came to America. I feel yeah. like that story is rather yeah. representative in terms of people who were perhaps more secularly minded yeah. were the ones who fled the revolution. Right? Yeah, I As think opposed so. To those who stayed back. I mean, uh, I don't want to generalize, but if, no, you look right. at, if you look at the Iranian community in America, Correct. Um, they're generally very secular. Right. Um, some of them are very anti-religious. Um, I mean, I have certain experiences with with you know um, aunties and uncles that saying, are are person. in my memory forever. And I mean, I, I asked a, an older relative one time for some reason there was a picture of the Kaaba somewhere. I don't remember exactly. I was maybe five or six years old, and, and so I said, "What is this thing?" Yeah. It, it, it was just it was so intriguing to me, the Kaaba. Yeah. And then the response from this relative was, oh, they believe that God lives in this box. That was a response that was given to me by an older relative. Wow. And, you know, I just, I, that, that stayed with me. I mean, to this day, I'm just like, what? They, they believe, it just sort of hit my fitzra, I guess. That's right. That there's, you know, God is in a box. Yeah. I and mean, what does that even mean? And, right. you know, is this, this is a strange religion. And, you know, things like that. So you wonder if that was just he being misinformed, he or she being misinformed or you know, intentional. No, I think it was, I think they had intentional animosity. Okay. You know, you know, they fled yeah. Iran during the revolution and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, even finding a wife in my early twenties, it was, it was difficult to, because my parents obviously wanted me to marry an, an Iranian woman. And, you know, I, it, it was difficult to, <laughs> so I married an Afghan. So my kids are mutts, you know, I call, <laughs> I call them a trio of mutts, you know, it's, it's a, you know, but yeah, that's, I think that's, Great. I mean, my sister, just, yeah. just to finish the yeah, point, sorry. my sister grew up in the same house I did, and she's, a, she's an atheist, and, mm -hmm. and she is always forwarding me things from Richard Dawkins, and, wow. <laughs> and you know, and, or like these really strange sort of clips that she finds on the internet of some, 
sheikh or an imam giving a speech and he yeah, says something extremely misogynistic and look this is your religion and so on and so forth right and it's so strange to me it's just mm. you know it's you know it's, that's not my religion I mean, yeah. that's that's his opinion and i totally disagree and this religion is, is so vast right and, and it's I mean, well now as studied as you are i mean it must make for some remarkable conversations i imagine yeah. at the dinner table with your sister <laughs> um uh, just you two just you, you she's the only sibling she's the only yeah, okay yeah. Mm-hmm. um i i was going to ask you um so yeah, religion aside, though, in, in terms of culture, yeah. uh, I know that also. Again, if I'm if I'm being generalizing or um, representative of what I've seen from mm. my anecdotal experiences with, with with the Irani community, is that there is a lot of pride, however, in the Persian right. civilization in Farsi uh, as a cultural. So would you say that was also true to your own experience? Yeah, d- yeah, definitely. Like you spoke the language at home. Uh, yeah, I can manage it. Okay. My mother only speaks to me in, in Farsi. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, I, there's uh, one of the criticisms I get from Farsi speakers is I need to do like khutbah, khutbah in Farsi. Mm-hmm. And I don't think my Farsi is up to that level. But, but certainly there was there was a uh, an emphasis on learning Farsi. My mother tried a few times and I was a kind of kind of a strange kid and yeah. very, a lot of energy and so it was I had a very short attention span so you know she took, took me to a certain place I don't remember where they were but you know to learn my Adif Bata and whatnot to be able to speak Farsi That's and, right. um, but I was more interested in, in sports at the time and I just didn't really care but you know we did the whole uh, the cultural thing during the Iranian New Year's and um, we went to Nowruz, not Nowruz. yeah Nowruz, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. and yeah. And uh, we tr- so we try to keep up with the cultural mm-hmm. aspects of the religion, and okay. you know my mother and my father would always you know, sort of uh, emphasize the fact that we're Iranian and we do have a proud history and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And uh, but and I remember there was even a Quran uh, in our house. Um, it was on the top shelf of the master bedroom, and it was wrapped in a beautiful cloth. And and uh, it was sort of was it? Used I remember on special I po- occasions even or mm-hmm. not even. Um, I think More once in a while, of, like just just, just for. Blessings. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. I think it was more for blessings. I remember one time I went up there and I, I pulled it down, and uh, when my parents were not home, and I opened it, and I was just, I was just amazed. Like, what language is? What is this thing? <laughs> right, right. And I, I had this sort of uh, really st- strong interest to, yeah. to to understand at least what this book is saying. Yeah. You know, but no, I find it fascinating. Just again, coming from also a children as, as a child of immigrants, yeah. uh, that from the subcontinent, um, very similar in the, in the sense that not a very, not, I would say rather secular kind of background, um, that is no longer the case. However, um, you know, growing up that way, but, you know, we were taught Quran, we mm-hmm. were taught, you know, to, you know, the, 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 the subcontinent experience, even yeah. from sort of secularized families, yeah. was a little different. There was still that kind of, the, the need to at least you know, teach the child yeah. Arabic, get a tutor or, or a ustaz to teach Arabic, and basic Islamic studies, mm-hmm. even if none of it was practiced at home. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I feel from, again, anecdotally, from people yeah. who did it, it migrate from Iran, there was a very conscious effort to, to, to reach yeah, out. Yeah, there was. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of anti Muslim sentiment mm-hmm. in, in my household. So my, my mother actually <laughs> um, uh, suggested that I go to the Mormon Sunday school. Uh, so I did go there for a while, and I remember I actually fell in love with the Bible during those years. Um, <laughs> I remember reading things in the New Testament that I thought were incredible. Yeah. Um, and I obviously had theological questions, and they were never adequately answered. Okay. So I never sort of gravitated towards the theology of Christianity. Right. And of course, Mormon theology is a bit different, but I did get answers from you know more orthodox or normative Trinitarian um, practitioners yeah, right uh, but there's something about the ethical teaching of Christ as it's recorded in the four Gospels that really struck a chord with me mm-hmm. so I remember when I was when I watched Malcolm X uh, and um, uh, I started to think about you know I need to know the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and I remember s- thinking with my 15 year old mind you know, I, I don't love the Prophet so I don't know anything about him, mm-hmm. but I love Isa alayhi mm-hmm. So I told myself, I have to be patient and inshallah, I'll start to love the Prophet sallallahu like I love Isa alayhi right. uh, So it was, it was difficult for a while because, you know, I had to pray in secret. I didn't actually start practicing until I was 19. Mm. I didn't know Fatiha until I was 19. I didn't know how to read anything. I didn't know Alif from Bao until I was 19 years old. 
I right? mean, for all practical purposes, you could <laughs> almost identify as a convert to the faith, right? Yeah, actually, yeah. I mean, I call yeah. myself sometimes a born-again Muslim, but it, I think my experience is more indicative of a, <laughs> of a convert. And it is amazing. I mean, an uh, African-American who was assassinated in 1965, born in Omaha, Nebraska, had such an incredible effect on some some kid born in Iran so 12 years after he was he was assassinated. Right. It's just incredible to me. It really is. You know? Yeah. Wow. Um, so, yeah. you know, there's that love of Malcolm X is always there. And of mm -hmm. course, um, uh, you know, I sometimes I go on YouTube now and and I just, you know, I, I just watch him with such awe that he's in this room and sometimes he's the only black man in the room and he has such is uh, sitting there. That's and, right. And it's incredible to me. A nobility. Yeah. 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 And I felt, yeah, the, I felt the same way when, you know, when I started practicing at 19, it was really uh, my first encounter with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, actually, that, you know, my mother took me. And again, this is very strange. My mother took me to um, an Eid prayer at, at MCA okay. uh, in Santa yeah, Clara. I want, I'd love to talk about that <laughs> as well. So, so at, up until this point, you, like you said, you, you started praying. Yeah, relatively in secret. You're learning. In see, uh, yeah, I pray in my room. I do all five, all five prayers at night, because oh, right. it, and I'd be sweating. Sometimes I can hear my father coming up the stairs, and and uh, so I I <laughs> cut my prayer short and flip open a magazine or something. It was a strange thing at the time. Fascinating. Yeah. So when do you? I guess you know come out <laughs> you know uh, yeah sorry <laughs> yeah yeah but you know when do you kind of yeah talk to your family about i mean so um, you went to eat sorry maybe yeah. that story yeah. leads us there so yeah so my mother took me to eat okay and, and um i remember we got there a little bit late so i'm mm -hmm. sitting in the back and it was absolutely packed and this is mca circa mid 90s this is 1996 probably okay wow yeah so Sheikh I mean, yeah. it's funny because we've this is another ongoing thread the, we've the had. tapestry the tapestry yeah. which is like where Sheikh Hamza fits into the yeah. to that tapestry, right. and we and for some reason, whether it's Osama we've had or others, 1995, 1996, Sheikh Hamza is like a recurring guest yeah. star he is. across multiple yeah. episodes right. of, and yet, this, of this tapestry. That yeah. we're and he, having since, him as a guest since episode has, one. That's right. It's since Osama, yeah. But he's eluded us as a guest though. Inshallah. Um, inshallah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. so 1995, 96, yeah. uh, which fascinatingly or interestingly enough, in my own part of the universe. Um, is also where I kind of intersect with, where my, my story intersects mm -hmm. with Sheikh Hamza's. But sorry, yeah, yeah. MCA so, 1996. Yeah. So I'm sitting in the back and yeah. he, he's, he's uh, speaking very loudly in Arabic. Hmm. And so I'm just sitting there going, well, you know, this is a waste of time and I don't understand what he's saying and why did I come here? And, you know, I just, you know, I'd rather study by myself and, you know, so on and so forth. And then he switches to English at some point. And I remember just being absolutely mesmerized yeah. I cannot even explain to you yeah. the effect that had on me For sure. I remember walking out you know and just tripping over people in front of me just staring at him like who is this man that's wow. right right so I remember it had it just incredible effect on me for several months and then um, one of my friends who was at the I attended a, a junior college at the time and I started going to the MSA meetings and one of them said, well, you know, Sheikh Hamza is teaching a Maliki fit class in, in, in Hayward. Uh, so I said, what's Maliki and what's fit? And he said, don't worry about it, just you come in. So I'm sitting there and, and it was him. And, I, and I'm just watching him and he's writing stuff in Arabic on the board. And I was like, whoa, he's writing, he knows Arabic. So <laughs> his mind is blown, yeah. right? And I didn't, I, I wasn't able to follow anything in the class. Okay. I mean, I had no idea. Did you know he was this white guy from Washington? I had no, no, walla, nothing, walla, but, walla, no, okay, no, nothing, nothing, okay, whatsoever. nothing. I just knew he was a convert. That's right. right. Okay. And then he actually made a wudu with like, I don't know, eight ounces of water or something. <laughs> I was there for that class. <laughs> and I'm just watching him going, wow, this is incredible. Uh, and You've then this class. <laughs> yeah. So I got, I, I understand nothing as far as the academic yeah. side of that class. Mm. But again, just like this incredible effect he just had on me, the way that he would carry himself, the way that he would speak. Uh, and then, and then he did a Sira series, the famous Sira series in the fall of '98. And By I the way, this location in Hayward you speak of is the old Zaytuna Institute, or the, no? Know, this is this is called the Islamic like Study School. I think it was oh. off Mission and Harder or something like that. Got it. It's not Jackson. It wasn't Jackson. No, okay. I don't think so. No, okay. it was it was uh, kind of down the hill from Cal State Hayward, that if I remember correctly. Later, I feel like. Uh, yeah, it might have come later. That's why or you may know better when. Uh, this this is ninety. The, this is ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight. Okay. No, but like when does when do they start using the facility on Jackson? Do you know? Probably uh, uh, early two, early two like yeah. thousands. Yeah. Probably early two yeah. yeah. thousands. That's, that's my yeah. yeah yeah yeah. So then he starts teaching with Sira, right? And uh, I remember that I, the one distinctly one distinct class is that he was talking about 
uh, the conquest of Mecca, mm. and he mentioned the name of the Prophet ﷺ, and then he started crying, mm. right? And I just remember thinking, wow, he really loves the Prophet ﷺ, mm. you know? Uh, so, I again, when, when I felt, again, this type of, I don't know, embarrassment, yeah. you know, I've never cried. It's the life of the Prophet set, it, right? Yeah. yeah. I think he's talking about when he when he enters Mecca, right? Enters Mecca, yeah. At the three bari right? Um, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was writing. Because yeah, I've heard that, out, you know. Such humility. So you yeah. can hear on the... You can hear on the audio, yeah, yeah in the CD. And yeah, I remember hearing thing. it as a wow. college student when they came out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I almost have it memorized, the moment yeah. where that had that impact on me as well. Yeah, Sorry. So I just remember yeah. the time thinking, I, I just I just want to hang around this guy <laughs> as much as I can. Yeah. And it's interesting because um, uh, I walked out of, we had a, my office was in the Euclid building in, um, in uh, at Zaytuna. Now we moved to the upper campus, but a few months ago I had an office in the Euclid building. And I remember walking out of my office uh, and just looking right and seeing Sheikh Hamza's office right there. Surreal, right? And it just hit me like, yeah. you know, Allah put me in his orbit, That's you know. Right. Um, and of course, Imam Zayd, Dr. Hatim. Uh, so I'm completely filled with this type of gratitude mm. uh, just for just for being around these people. That's right. So, you know, Malcolm X, Sheikh Hamza, they, they I, I, was about to, I mean, I mean, when you take a, even an even broader view, that journey for you started with Malcolm X yeah. to Alex Haley to Spike Lee. Yeah. I mean, look at this. Yeah. I mean, and then I've, I've had Muslims come to me and say, you should move to the Middle East because, the, you know, there's Anwar. And I said, yeah, and they said, but there's nothing here. I said, this is where I became Muslim. And mm. this is this. I mean, this is a this is a sacred place to me. That's right. This is where it all happened. I mean, I don't know what I'd be doing if I was in Iran right now. Probably some accountant is in cubicle. Or <laughs> I don't know what I'd be doing. No, it's know. fascinating. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So um, there's awliya buried here. I mean, mm. I mean, there. Wow. Thirty percent of the African slaves that were brought here were Muslim. Many of them are awliya. They were hafad of Quran, and this soil is sacred. Hmm. Wow, you know? that's powerful. Um, so, you. Um, do you go to Yemen at this point? I mean, to oh, advance so, your studies or yeah? Still so there? I would study locally f okay. uh, throughout the nineties. Okay, uh, and then two thousand seven. Now at this point, what's the relationship like back at home? Back at home. Oh, so during this, so yeah, the coming out. Um, <laughs> uh, ba so basically, um, I when I went when I moved out uh, for undergraduate studies, I attended Cal Poly in um, San Luis Obispo. Right. So I was uh, 19 at the time or so. Uh, so, uh, you know, I joined the MSA there and I obviously had my own apartment. And so I would come back every so often and I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to start doing my prayers and I'm not going to care about what anyone says and I'll let them see me pray and whatnot. So it actually wasn't that bad. I think, I think they were more, my parents were more concerned for me when I was a younger teenager mm -hmm. because they thought maybe I was falling into the wrong sort of crowd or I was, be, was going to become an extremist or something like that. I mean, parents always have good intentions with their children. Right. Right. So obviously they've had, they've had bad experiences, I guess, in Iran and they've heard certain things and whatnot. Uh, but I think when they saw that I'm, you know, late teens, early 20s, and I'm actually studying accounting now at, at, uh, at Cal Poly, uh, okay, I guess it's okay for him to have a spiritual aspect. I mean, nice. my parent, my mother always wanted me to have some sort of spiritual life, if mm. you will. So that's why she recommended that I go to these Christian Sunday schools. Uh, but the unintended result of that was a, a sort of love affair with, with the, the Bible. Bible. You know, that's, that's just, and it, it obviously continues to this day. Right. As and I went, I went through my phase when I was an undergrad. I was a, I was a very staunch sort of Islamic polemicist, uh, Ahmadidat Ahmad. style. I would actually mm. prey on Christians on campus. I would s search and destroy them, basically. Uh, it was very strange. We had this um, Dawa table booth, and I was a pamphleteer at the time. And, yeah. and um, you know, and, and Cal Poly is sort of the California Bible Belt. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, at Campus Crusade is like 900 students. Really? And, yeah, okay. people very religious in the Central Coast compared yeah. to the Bay Area. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, so, I mean, I remember one, one night at Farmer's Market, we had this thing, Farmer's Market, we have all these, you know, vendors and whatnot, and you have Christian booth, the atheist, and so I, I approached the Christian uh, table, and um, I started debating them, and, uh, and um, you know, ridiculing them and whatnot, and I remember there was an older guy there, I don't think he was a student or anything, but he was just happened to be there, and he looked at me and he said, he said, you don't really care about us, mm -hmm. you know. 
And wow. I said, what do you mean? Huh. He said, if you really cared about us, you wouldn't have this attitude with us. Mm. And of course I said, you don't know what you're talking about. And you know, you can't answer my questions. And you know, where does Jesus say I'm God in the new Testament? And, and, uh, you know, and, you know, quote things out of context and whatnot and very polemical, very, you know, disrespectful type of style. And then, so I left and I went back to my dorm room and I just sat there looking out the window and I remember just thinking, he's right. Mm. You know, mm. I'm, I'm just, this is for nuffs. That's amazing. This is all nuffs. Right. You know, so at that point, because I still love the Bible, yeah. you know, uh, I decided that I'm going to improve <laughs> my Dawa tactics and actually show a type of reverence for the tradition and e even more reverence for the text. Right. So I actually made a decision. I'm going to start learning biblical languages. I'm going to learn Christian theology properly. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to engage in, in jidal, that is, bil hikmah wal mu'idhat al hasana. That's right. That's you know? says, yeah, right. exactly. And I remember at the time, I mean, there were Muslims around me that uh, I know they disagreed with my tactics. And I think out of sort of adab or something, maybe they were afraid of me or something. They just, they just sort of didn't say anything to me. Mm -hmm. And I wish they had at the time, because yeah. mm -hmm. that phase went on for a while. And I actually wrote a book called In Defense of Islam in, in 2003. Uh, and it's sort of a manual. Mm -hmm. I compare it to like DDAT's combat kit, if you remember, remember that. that very thing. well, yeah. <laughs> and so you know, I wrote this thing and um, somebody put it online you know, so it's still online now. People yeah. can find it. I probably shouldn't mention this, but uh, <laughs> I remember I give it to Imam Zaid Shakir uh -huh. back at, in 2003. Wow. And he read it and he said, yeah, it's good, but you should wait till you're 40 until you publish it. That was right. his advice. And I remember that, what, 40? I'm 25 or 26, whatever. What do you mean 40? I have to wait that long? Mm -hmm. So I said, fine. Um, uh, but then somebody did put it on the internet, but I looked at it when I turned 40. I'm 40 now, yeah. a few months ago. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you this, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe half of it I don't agree with. And the other half, I don't agree with the way I wrote it. Mm. And it's just, that's, that's wisdom. Such I mean, wisdom. He, he told me straight up, you Such know. Wisdom. Youth is wasted on the young. I, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because um, I applied at a job at St. Mary's College a few years ago to teach the in intro to Islam. And this is in Moraga. And the, the, the uh, director of religious studies or the head of the department. Uh, and I had letters of recommendation from like, you know, Imam Zaid and Dr. Hatim, Sister Marianne Farina, who's oh, a DSPT. Wow. Yeah. And then he called me and he said, you know, I have a problem. I said, what's that? And he said, I, I just can't reconcile something. I'm getting these great letters of rec mm -hmm. from you. But then I went online and I found this book you wrote. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. yeah. And I said, yeah, you know, I was an idiot. And this was before <laughs> my formal studies. And like, yeah. I wasn't 40 yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then he quoted some of it to Ooh. me. And I remember my face Ooh. just turning red. And I did the face palm thing. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, look, he said, look, you can believe whatever you want. Yeah. But, you know, uh, but do you still agree with the sentiments of this of this book? And I said, no, I don't at all. And you know, the, the letters of wreck are accurate. I was young and immature and right. that's the thing. I mean, you put something, you write something, it's there. Oh, and now, it's there. nowadays, if it's on the internet, it's, it's there it's, for life. It's a very long tail. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so then in, in order then, um, you, you, you've started delving more into like sort of biblical studies, yeah. Hebrew, uh, yeah. Greek. Mm -hmm. And where does um, Yemen, the little detour in Yemen? Yeah, in? so and I was. Was that by the recommendation of people like Sheikh Hamza and others? Well, I think it's. Uh, um, or had you seen the Habayat well, come well, here? Uh, Sheikh Yahya wrote us actually, okay. um, and uh, apparently, I, I, I mean, I have faint memories of him in the late '90s and whatnot, and uh, of. Of Yahya, of Yahya oh, Rodas, yeah. I think he converted in 1996. Yes. Right? Uh, and so he went to Yemen and he came back for a visit, I think it was in 2005 or so. And uh, his, his, his demeanor, his character, his knowledge just, just impressed me. Mm. Uh, so he advised me to study in Yemen. Mm. Um, and he, he has a house there and to, to be with the Habaib. Mm. So, I mean, nothing's, nothing's real unless your wife is on board, right? As they <laughs> say. So, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me, you know, a wife that is in, incredible. I yeah. mean, and something I, someone I definitely don't deserve. Uh, but... Uh, we all decided to go. I had I have three daughters now, but the older two were very young at the time. I think they were four and two at the time. Wow. So anyway, we studied there. And this was, you know, at the time, uh, uh, 
this was 2007. Okay. So I'm nearly 30. Yeah. Um, I had done a bunch of um, independent type studies and studies with local Bay Area scholars at the time. Um, I had engaged in uh, several interfaith dialogues and um, and I had started the process of learning biblical languages and whatnot. But before I went to Yemen, I applied for a master's, the master's program with the Graduate Theological Union. Okay. And I didn't think I'd get in because my high school grades were atrocious. And, you know, I sort of winged the GRE, but I had letter, great letters of rec, yeah. you know. Uh, and so um, when I was in Yemen, my mother phoned me and she said, you got into this, this institution. Oh, wow. Yeah, the letter's so, waiting oh, for you. Yeah. yeah. So when I came back from Yemen, I did a master's in, uh, in New Testament. Mm -hmm. I focused in biblical languages. And then I did a PhD after that in basically in comparative theology. And I did a, a, a uh, Sufi, I guess you can call it, hermeneutic of the Gospel of John. Mm. So I translated part of the Gospel of John. And I played with this idea that, you know, so, so with the Bible, there are two, there are two theories as to what happened. Uh, because we have this doctrine known as tahrif of corruption. Or is, it ta is it tahrif of the nas? Is the text of the Bible corrupted? Mm -hmm. Or is it of the exegesis of the ma'ani? And the dominant opinion is that uh, it's really both. But Imam al-Ghazali sort of plays with this idea that what the Christians call the Injil is actually the Injil. And the tahrif is in the post, I guess you can call it the post-apostolic exegesis or the proto-trinitarian mm -hmm. exegesis of the text yeah. so but the text is sound so mm. for example when when isa alayhi salam he says in john chapter 10 verse 30 the father and i are one right. you know uh, trinitarians obviously take that to denote an ontological type of oneness because according to trinitarian theology the son and the father are homoousios which is the greek term that they're co-substantial co-equal mm -hmm. in their essence uh, but Ghazali in the Raddu Jamil, and some say this is a pseudonymous work, that he didn't actually write it, but it's written in his style, Allahu Alam. He makes an interesting point saying, look, if you look at the context of that statement of Isa alayhi salam, it's very clear that it's a unity of purpose, mm -hmm. that he's intimating his, his mystical union with, with the Father, as it were. And he says, whenever you read Father in the New Testament, Ab means Rab, because that's, ah, that's okay. who you're... Your, your, your Ab is your Rab, right. because he's the one that brings you up in stages. It's not a biological or... It's, yeah, it's, it's a figurative, figurative. it's jazz. Yeah. Come out by any we are one. one. It's like saying we are on the same page. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sort of yeah. exactly. It's, it's, it's mystical union, a yeah. union of will born out Correct. of love. It's not an ontological oneness. Mm. And huh. then, so, as I did further research, I realized that there were early Christians who did actually interpret the text like that. Mm. You know, because, you know, there were Unitarian Christians from the very beginning. Uh, so, I, so I entertain this idea that this is the gospel, and if it is, well, how would you deal with right. it? You know, so that's one verse. Another one, you know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So some of these things you have to look at in the original Greek and sort of um, take a type of exegesis from the language itself, mm -hmm. so study philology and things like that. But there's a way that you can, in my opinion, you can reconcile every single thing in all four gospels with uh, our theology. Yeah. Even the, the crucifixion narratives, which is very controversial. Uh, but some of the ulama play with this idea that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to Isa alayhi salam, that I will seize your soul and raise you up to myself. Right. So, you know, this idea of, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know they, they did not kill him nor crucify him. Mm -hmm. Well, it can well, that, that right. Isa alayhi salam did not die from... It was made to appear from, as such. from injury sustained at the hands of Bani Israel, but, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seized his soul and might have returned it to him. I mean, there are things written like this. Um, Imam al Zimakhshari sort of plays with this idea of what, what could it mean? Does it mean that somebody was turned into the likeness of Christ? Or does it mean that the entire crucifixion was sort of made dubious mm -hmm. to the Bani Israel? Mm -hmm. So they you know, problematize it. Imam al Razi mentions a few things as well because Imam Zimakhshari obviously is a Mu'tazili right. uh, scholar, but his, his uh, linguistic um, analysis is, is incredible. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's basically what my, my doctoral work was on. Mm. Is, and of course you have the, the other opinion is, is that the text itself has changed and that's the dominant opinion. Correct. You know, um, so, so... Like dominant opinion according to Muslim scholars. Muslim saying, scholars, yeah. 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 Um, and then where does, within that, in your opinion then, uh, the prophetic statement or tradition, 
uh, of, you know, we neither confirm nor deny. Yeah. Right? Specific. Ver now, does that refer to specific verses? Yeah. Well, there's what there's the three hadith. Talking about? Yeah. There are three hadith that deal with uh, the Israelite traditions or Israeliyat. Correct. So, um, uh, there's a there's a hadith uh, hadithu an bani israel wala haraj you know relate from the bani israel and there's nothing wrong with that and there's another hadith and that's from bukhari the other one from ahmad i believe musnad ahmad of sayyidina umar reading a torah right this is the one that was uh, very much quoted to me my entire life by muslims and you're not allowed to read the bible because sayyidina umar was reading the torah and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he disapproved of that so you know i asked some of my teachers and they said well it's not for umar to read the torah you know, mm. it's not his job to do that. Right. You know, it's not. You know, it's that he he's he's just so, he's supposed to do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, but there are other Sahabs. Zaid ibn Thabit. I mean, he learned Hebrew mm. uh, reportedly in in a few weeks in order to improve the da'wah mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, and then you know, la tu la tu wa la tu kathibuha. Right. Yeah, if the time, the context of the hadith is that some of the Jews in Medina. They were they were apparently Which translating. Which for our listeners is the hadith that I just referenced. The one yeah, you just referenced, yeah. It's related by Abu Huraira, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So he said that um, the hadith says that some of the Jews in Medina were translating the Bible from Hebrew into Arabic. Okay. So you know, don't confirm what they're saying, mm -hmm. nor belie what they're saying. And the way I take that is, look at the text, see if you know, see if the text matches what they're saying. So don't confirm or deny what they're telling you about mm -hmm. the Torah or the Injil. Not necessarily a prohibition against reading those texts, mm. um, but for the most, I, I mean, it's it's I, I'm I'm in the mainstream in the sense that uh, I believe in supersessionism. I believe the ahkam of the Torah and the Gospel have been have been abrogated by the ahkam of the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm in that sort of Sunni correct in orthodoxy, if yeah. you will. Uh, but this idea that um, that you know these these texts uh, have have been corrupted beyond recognition. I mean, it's there's a hadith in Bukhari that Waraka bin Nofal used to write the Injil in Hebrew. So what is he writing? What what is what is the what is the relator of this hadith referring to? Some Injil archetype that is now lost that he has access to. Mm. I mean, he's obviously writing the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think right. uh, I think. It, uh, you know this uh, the the uh, scholarship in, right. in in comparative theology, especially with with the books of Ahlul Kitab, Jews and Christians. It needs a lot of work on our side. We're very right. anemic in we our are. studies. That's and, right. And you have non-Muslim scholars that have incredible scholarship when it comes to Quranic studies. That's right. I mean, Western academia is is yeah. filled with with, with people yeah. like that. Um, so you know, and then also the idea of the Quran and the Prophet, you know, peace be upon him, calling himself. You know, musaddiq, right? Referring yeah. to him, so that again goes back to that idea of of affirming certain yeah. aspects of, right. uh, of 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 previous scripture. Right. I mean, am I reading that correctly? Or yeah, I definitely transmitting that correctly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the Quran um, in many in many places in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will engage intertextually with the biblical text, mm. and oftentimes that's lost on on a reader who doesn't understand. Um, that whole aspect of the Quran. So you have, for example, one of my students, a former Protestant, a Lutheran, who was reading the end of Al Maida, mm -hmm. and she said, "That's the Last Supper, right?" And I said, "What?" And she said, "That's what it's referring to, right?" So I never even that never even occurred to me. So the, just again, for fifth, the fifth chapter of the Quran, known as uh -huh. Surah Al Maida, Ma or when, the table spread. Right. Mm -hmm. When uh, when the disciples come to Isa, they and they ask him for a banquet or a table spread. Al Maida is like a table with food on it. Correct. And then he makes dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and, and it appears, and they eat from it. Uh, so something like that is, is. I mean, if you if you study sort of cutting edge Western. Contemporary scholarship on the Quran right now. It's people like Michelle Kuypers looking at the rhetoric the composition of the Quran. So this type of um, um, What is it uh, intratextual? analysis uh, of, of the Quran looking at its um, its symmetry but also intertextual engagement. How does the Quran engage right. with other texts? Right. Uh, because according to Kuypers and, and Raymond Farron, and I mean, again, most of these people are non-Muslim, but it's incredible scholarship. We could certainly benefit from it. Mm. Uh, Michelle Kuyper's book is on Al-Ma'ida. He says the entire surah is one big chiasm. It's incredible. The it's beginning. Chiasm. So it's basically the beginning of the surah yeah. mirrors the very end of it. 
Mm. There's there's a there's a there's a mirroring, and then the second part of the surah mirrors the second to last mm. part of it, until wow. and there's a focus in the middle. Right. Yeah, and Farron says the same thing about al-Baqarah, and you think about it. I mean, that must be an aspect of the ijaz of the Quran. I mean, Imam al-Razi writes a little bit about sort of the relationship between the ayat and the suwar. He calls it al-munasabat, right? Uh, but this scholarship is incredible. When you think about it, you know these are ayat being revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam over years, right. and he's not writing it down. And for him to know how to do this, if he is the author of the Quran, right? right. How, how does he know where to put certain That's things right. so that this structure isn't compromised? Right. You know, isn't intact. Over 23 years with right. different suar being revealed to him, it's just incredible it when is. you think about it. Right. You know, so that's their focus is on you know the sort of internal structure of the quran as right. well as its engagement intertextually uh, with the biblical text right. for example the quran calls isa alayhi salam the kalima of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now the only other text that i know of in the christian tradition that refers to jesus as the word at least a canonical text is the gospel of john mm -hmm. you know so is it the same i mean there, there's going to be debates right now if if the logos right in john 1 1 is um, the second person of a, of a triune God and, you know, ontologically the same as the Father. Right. Why is the Quran making a reference to this, to this ayat or the, to this passage, the prologue of John's Gospel? Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's to sort of correct the... Um, Adulterated uh, by yeah. that point. Yeah, but that, you know, some would say, well, that sounds kind of strange. I mean, mm -hmm. you're quoting or alluding to a passage that's been adulterated yeah. or fabricated. Perhaps there's another way of interpreting that right. passage in John. And of course there is. And again, if you look at the linguistics, N-R-K, ain halagas, in the beginning was the word, kai uh, halagas, ain prostan theon, and the word was with the God. There's a definite article in the Greek yeah. before God. K, and then it says kai theos, ain halagas. And a God was the word without the definite article. Mm -hmm. And in Greek, you know, it's, it's, and it sounds kind of strange, but anyone who has sort of a, um, a, an extraordinary ability, you can refer to that person as a theos or a, a divine lowercase d person. So the, the way that this is translated in Trinitarian mm -hmm. Bibles is in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, capital G, and the word was God, capital G, but that's not actually what it says. Mm. It says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with the God, capital G, and the divine or sanctified entity was the word. Mm. You know, so there's a very clear hermeneutic, uh, Unitarian hermeneutic right. of John 1.1 1, 1 that predates Islam, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and it's always been in the Christian tradition. That's right. Uh, so, yeah. So, I, I mean, I feel like we can, there's so much to talk about. I, I, like, we just got schooled like, on, on a I, Sunday. I, I, this my is brain like, is like buffering, you know, the, the thing <laughs> each no, I find it fascinating. We're, we're recording on a Sunday uh, in a school. So this is like Sunday school for Zucky and I. Uh, yeah. in the literal <laughs> sense because we're talking about the Old Testament and the New it's Testament. It's something wild. No, um, no but I, I, if I could just sort of like, again, for the sake of uh, kind of maybe bringing an end to the conversation around this, um, I want to take you back to like sort of Christ, like, like uh, I guess in terms of what Muslims can negotiate or accept with regards to uh, normative understanding of Christology, right? Hmm. About Christ. And you, and, you, and you mentioned this idea of Christ being the word. Um, yeah. And, and, and even you, 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 earlier you spoke of uh, the crucifixion. Because oftentimes yeah. when I have conversations with Muslims about the crucifixion, I mean, one of the things I kind of point out is, look, I mean, the, the events or the details of the crucifixion in terms mm. of the what's, how, when, yeah. that's immaterial. Yeah. What's of consequence to, as far as Christianity is concerned, is 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 what that what the crucifixion meant, right? Right, Christ dying for the sins exactly. of humanity, yeah. and then the subsequent resurrection. So, if you could, from a normative Muslim standpoint, yeah. you know, what does the normative Muslim position allow to be negotiated with regards to? Yeah, Christ. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, there's a there's and more a, specifically the the the, the uh, crucifixion and resurrection, right? Yeah. Because as far as Christ, the living Master, yeah. there's hardly any disagreements between Bibli you know, between Christian yeah. and Muslim understanding. It's yeah. where you talk about the resurrected Lord. Right. Uh, or the notion of Christ, the risen Lord, yeah. where we obviously have a point. Of yeah, departure. I mean, there, there's nothing. Um, there's there's nothing in my understanding of <laughs> of our aqidah 
uh, that necessitates the belief that Christ was not literally crucified. I mean, prophets were cut in half. It, it is mentioned in, in, in right. written reports. Um, so I think oftentimes Muslims will they'll, um, uh, gravitate towards certain positions right. because they're in contradistinction to the Christian position because exactly. many imagine this sort of uh, cosmic battle that we're in with the Christians. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes uh, you'll find uh, Sunni ulama who will um, not quote uh, hadith related by Ahl al-Bayt because of this, again, this sort of uh, um, uh, prejudice they have against the Shia, even though we have hadith in our tradition uh, related by Ahl al-Bayt and it's, you know, it's obligatory for us to love Ahl al-Bayt and, and of course you have that on the other side as well. It's interesting, there's a book by Todd Lawson, it's very interesting, it's on the crucifixion in the Quran. Okay. And Lawson's claim is that the first exeget in Islamic history, or the first exeget in history, or famous exeget in history, who interpreted uh, 4.157 of the Quran to be endorsing this type of literal docetism, which means that someone else was literally uh, substituted for Isa salam, was a Christian exeget named John of Damascene. Mm. He was the first one to posit that interpretation of the Quranic ayah. And he was a polemicist, I mean, exactly. against Islam. He was, yeah. Right. I one mean, of the earliest polemicists. Yeah. He wrote about the Prophet, I think, as well. Yeah, right? and he actually he didn't. John he, of Damascus. Yeah, he actually believed that uh, we were a deviant sect of Christianity. Correct. Correct. He called us the sect of the Hagarians. Right, oh, where After we get Hagarism oh, later on. Yeah, exactly. P P Patricia Crone. Yeah, exactly. So according to Lawson, later scholars somehow adopted this idea that it was literal docetism, that someone else was uh, transformed to look like Christ. And of course, there are no prophetic statements that are authentic that have any details, as you mentioned, right. about what actually happened, because that's not really important. That's right. So it's certainly within the realm of conceivability that he might have been uh, crucified, but God took his soul from him. I mean, if you look up Tawaffa in Lisan al-Arab, Al-Qabtu al ruh to seize one's soul, Inni mm mutawafika. -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Imam Ghazali, he's interesting, because um, he quotes Al-Hallaj, the great Sufi master, who was the divine martyr of love, as it were, right? <laughs> Uh, when he was being crucified, he yeah. said, wa ma qataluhu wa ma salabuhu. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? Yeah. Did, 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 was he somehow, did he claim or something? Did his followers claim that his body was, was substituted? Was, no. Yeah. So the significance of that is you, you can kill my body, yeah. but you can't kill my khulud or like my everlasting. So Bani Israel or the Pharisees at the time thinking, well, we're done with this guy for good. Right. Mm. I mean, you haven't seen anything yet. You can't mm. kill. You can't really kill the Messiah. Right. right. And then as a proof that indeed this was the Messiah, it's certainly conceivable that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returned his ruh. He's ruh Allah. Yeah. Returned his ruh back to Isa alayhi salam. And he was seen by people walking around. It doesn't mean he's God. It doesn't mean he's the son of God. I mean, Lazarus was resurrected. It doesn't mean he's God. That's right. Right. And then yeah. Jesus uh, alayhi salam, according to three gospels in a synoptic tradition, he's, he basically says that, you know, what, what's going, what happened to Jonah is going to happen to me. Uh, Jonah is the type, and he's the anti-type, and this is a type of typological. This is a uh, missionary menace, right? We're yeah. three days and three nights in the belly yeah, of the I mean, whale. I mean, I think he's the son of man. But I, I think right. he's focusing on the wrong issue, right? You know, it's it's this idea that uh, that um, you know that he's he's his mission or his messiahship in this case right. has been um, uh, validated mm -hmm. uh, by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala thinking that they had killed him mm -hmm. for good and then and then God resurrects him. I mean it certainly doesn't mean that he's he's God himself because Jonah's not God. Lazarus is not God. There were people Matthew mentions that when Jesus was resurrected, some Jewish saints were also resurrected, walking around the cities of Jerusalem. That's what God can do. Right. Right? Who are these Jewish what happened to them? We have no idea. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's an interesting topic. It you really know, is. And, and, it's, and uh, we could, I mean, wait with the right person to talk oh, to, man. but yeah. we could go for hours and hours. Um, I, I think maybe to try to wrap up, I mean, there's a lot to talk about um, with you, I, I, and I knew we were going to get into a lot of uh, topics. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I know you've been at least speaking about of late um, is some of the challenges that confront um, a lot of our youth that end up, you know, th that encounter... Uh, particular, um, I guess, worldviews once they get to college, yeah. um, and and I, you know, I, I think that's a, a very important conversation to have, and, yeah. and and maybe in the time that we do have with you, 
to kind of maybe shift focus and to kind of talk about what you feel are some of the challenges. I mean, is that being, you know, you, you encounter young people, you know, in your own, obviously your day job as a professor as well. So, I mean, I'd love for you, the, the exchange that you two can have in terms of some of the challenges that you feel confront Muslims as they enter the college, you know, enter universities. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, there's a... I mean, because people are, I mean, the, they're losing their faith. I mean, this is yeah. why... It I mean, it's an exaggeration. The spectrum, you know, it's, it's, the right. Ab- Abrahamic morality is under attack there you go. in the academy. That's right. what wow. it is. So, you know, I always tell people that you know the Ahmad Didat days are over. We need to actually come together with with Christians and, and Jews because, you know, th- you know the other side doesn't they they don't um, discriminate. Yeah. Uh, who I mean, it's, it's Abrahamic morality. You know, so this idea that there's there's no objective truth, right? Uh, Abraham, you know, we call him the patriarch, and you have very liberal students, very quote unquote progressive students, who are constantly attacking what they refer to as the patriarchy. Right. That that before Abrahamic tradition, uh, the world was just this, you know, utopia, and it's these evil Semitic religions with, with these with these men that came in and subjugated women, and you know, so on and so forth. And we need to get back to that time again, so we can realize this utopia uh, on Earth. Uh, so there's no objective truth. Um, it's everything is power plays, right? This type of postmodernist philosophy. The only way to read a text is through the lens of deconstructionism. Right. There's there's no normative interpretation right. of the text. So many many Muslim students in these classrooms, and which they, is at the bedrock of postmodernism. Exactly, what you just identified. Yeah, exactly. They, yeah. They, they feel De- deconstructionism. In, exactly, they feel embarrassed to even speak in class. They feel embarrassed that they actually believe in right and wrong, theologically and morally. Right. They I think what's interesting. I don't mean to cut you off, or even make light of what you're talking about, but I think it would make for an interesting conversation. Is I have heard you sort of reference Star Wars. Oh yeah, <laughs> as kind of being the ultimate sort of postmodern or the, the more recent yeah. iterations of Star right. Wars. And I know Zucky will have some interesting things to say about that. So I mean, maybe if you could tie it in for, and I think it'd be fun for our listeners as well. well. It, uh, yeah. Just to just to to, yeah. to piggyback off of what you're saying. I mean, I, I've seen. Dis- discourse as it pertains to what we're seeing right now w- uh, with Star Wars yeah. it, a- and drawing parallels with like the the Reformation mm. and uh, you know the the idea that George Lucas was sort of like the Catholic Church he was the uh-huh. singular authority and then you have this Reformation and now you yeah. have people who are deciding dogma and people the masses are saying well who gave you the right to decide this you know here's your yeah. forty uh, yeah. flaws I'm yeah. going to nail this to yeah. the the, you know. Yeah, because I mean, it's like yeah. you should know, Doctor Atai. I mean, we're we're huge Star Wars geeks here. So yeah. So so for us, this conversation and it, you know, if you have it within the sort of lens, Star Wars would be even more fascinating. Well, and and, yeah. and especially because we're seeing, you know, you and I are discussing this in a very lighthearted frame. Yeah. People are not treating it very lightheartedly. I mean, this is yeah. like a you mean the dog, fan base a crisis of dogma. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's wailing and gnashing of teeth and rending of garments because of, <laughs> uh, you know, because because perceived this orthodoxy holy, is the being, holy scripture right. is being challenged. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm saying this only partially joking because what I see online is sort of fascinating and it is indicative of it. To me, it's indicative of people searching for something in the yeah. absence uh, in in having rejected, mm. uh, you know, a, a, a spiritual frame. They're seeking something, you know, and right. and yeah. to whatever extent people have found guidance in mm. Star Wars. You're, I mean, it's it's amazing. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I think it's on full display, this rejection of traditional value systems. You know, this idea that, you know, the, the Luke Skywalker, he's he's an old guy. He just needs to get out of the way. Just die already. You know, the old people just get 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 out of the way. Let us young people take over. Right. And, you know, it's, you know, this idea that, you know, s- you know, studying and, and putting in long hours of training, it's not necessary. Like go over the past, kill it if you have to, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, exactly. That's what Kylo but, Ren says but to me. That's the bad guy who's saying that. No, I know, I know, I know. It, the it, movie's it, not endorsing it. Yeah. Necessarily. Well, you two well, can yeah. argue it out, but I mean, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, no, I, but, but what you're saying I think what is, you're, yeah. is uh, certainly, yeah, in, in my experience as an instructor, I mm-hmm. definitely see that 
uh, th there is this rejection. Certainly. Uh, not overtly necessarily, but the idea that these are antiquated ways of thinking. We've yeah. evolved past that. That's right. And, no, and yeah. these issues of, like you said, deconstru deconstructionism, yeah. a rejection of patriarchy, a rejection of tradition or traditional values, Abrahamic mor morality. Yeah. Um, I mean, we see this play out. You know, I mean, all the time, whether it was the Kavanaugh hearings of late or, or, yeah. or elsewhere. So, I mean, I think the, the issues you're highlighting here, um, you know, I, I think are really critical. And, I, and so you would identify these as being some of the, the sort of most uh, critical issues that confront it, these our, yeah, our young definitely. You know, and, and the academy, children that this are is the going into the academia. It's the greatest challenge, and this is why there's massive ridda, like you mentioned. There's so much. I've also it. heard about like sort of what what people have coined or, or termed scientism, mm -hmm. the idea where that that science um, sort of scientism, yeah. yeah, being different from obviously an embrace of science. Well, yeah, certainly, <laughs> yeah. but also different from recognizing the importance of science, but where. I mean, is it, yeah. I mean, you've heard this term. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's sort of okay. the. And maybe you can do a better job so, of articulating. So, so treating science. Well, I'll, I'll let Dr. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, new atheism. Um, you know, right. there's the, the the four horsemen, who Hitchens who passed, and then you have Richard Dawkins and yeah. Daniel Sam Dennett, Dennett, Sam Harris, Sam, Bill Maher. Yeah, Bill <laughs> Maher. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, it's a false dichotomy, mm -hmm. like science and religion. Are right. you going to believe science, or are you going to accept science, which is which is based on fact? Or are you going to believe in these religions that yes. you know that are antiquated and immoral and um, you know so on and so forth? Wow. Uh, so you know students are confronted with this dichotomy and they have no idea what to do with it. Right. Um, and you know I, I, there's a there's a book I recommend John Hot. Um, I think he's a Jesuit and he wrote a book called uh, God and the, the New Atheism, which is really interesting because he deals with with those four new atheists as you know neo atheists whatever they're called uh, figures. Uh, and basically says that, that that is also a religion. That's the religion of scientism. You know, it's, uh, they're accepting certain uh, things, a certain um, uh, assumptions, that, and, and they don't question them. And you don't have people going, you don't have students going through the theorems and equations and trying to prove them. What if those equations are wrong? Mm -hmm. They just simply accept you're them. There's always a space. level so just a different of trust and taklid, of course. Taklid, yeah. 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 yeah, and then this idea of explanatory mon monism. Just because we know how something works doesn't negate God. Mm. Right? We, know, we know, like they say, you know, Isaac Newton didn't know why the planets go around the sun in the same direction. Uh, so he filled in the gap of his ignorance with God, the God of the gaps argument. But now we know why the planets go around the sun. And that doesn't negate God. That's a non sequitur argument. It's a terrible argument. Just because I know how my cell phone works doesn't mean it, it didn't have an engineer and a creator and so on and so forth. So an explanatory monism is just one way of explaining something, mm -hmm. right? Or looking at a, uh, I think, um, who is it? Uh, William Chittick uses this example that there's a beautiful painting and yeah. you know if you put a you know tell ask a, a a scientist about this painting and they'll do a bunch of tests on the on the um the canvas and on the paint and so on and so forth and they give you all these all this incredible information and then put a child in front of the painting and the child will wonder what i wonder what this this portrait means mm -hmm. like the mona lisa what is she thinking? What does it mean? What's the significance of it? Right. You know, so just because you know how something works or what it is, the deeper question is why? Why the universe? Hmm. You know, that's that's the realm of theology. That's right. Right. It's the old chestnut about, uh, or is that absence of evidence doesn't equal evidence of absence? Mm. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it's um, it, that's that's also a big challenge right yeah. now. Is so how do you? I mean, just again, I mean, if you could give some pointers in terms of parents who are concerned with this, obviously, like, how do you inoculate our children from, from, from some of this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult. Because, I mean, they're not getting it at their Saturday school or Sunday schools. I mean, this isn't the kind of Islam, that, or I should say, what they need in terms of an inoculation, um, yeah. the, that type of a religious study isn't being, being promulgated at, yeah. you know, full-time Islamic schools or even the members. Yeah. You know? I mean, the answer is a strong foundation in ilm okay. and also love. I mean, love is powerful. And if you, if you can um, be the means by which your children love Allah and his messenger, that love, inshallah, will last uh, forever, even if they're challenged intellectually. Right. You know? hmm. So it's very important to have that strong foundation. Hmm. Um, but you, like you said, it's, it's very difficult because uh, you know, st students, they, they do research on the internet, 
and you know sometimes they hear things that are many times they hear things that are extremely anti-Muslim and they're not going to bring those things up with their parents or with with the e local imam at the masjid and whatnot right. but I think students should be encouraged to bring up whatever they want you know there was a young man who said to me he was in eighth grade or something and he said yeah he said I have all these doubts about my religion and I can't possibly tell my father because he's gonna be so angry he might even beat me and so I said, just just ask me and email me, and you know, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna get angry, and, and I encourage you to do that. But but parents have to give have to have to sort of give this environment or this vibe to their children mm -hmm. that it's okay to ask whatever you want, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, there there are students now that are, are young Muslims now that are just simply going through motions in the masajid. Oh, right. One of them confided to me, you know, I pray at Jummah, I don't really believe anything. I open the mushaf, I just stare blankly into its pages and. You know this type of thing and a lot of it has to do with you know their parents coming here uh, because back home as it were you know there's no internet back then all of the questions were about orthopraxis right. in other words you know if i'm traveling and i have to make wudu and everyone was sort of the same madhab on the mm -hmm. same minhaj but here it's such a melting pot and there's internet and they have you know they go to school and there's atheists and there's christians and there's you know different types of people there and, and it's, it's it's you know parents are not uh, they're not equipped intellectually mm -hmm. Uh, and they just, you know, they, they don't know how to deal with it. That's right. No, because, I mean, I think back to, if I think back to when I was at that age, right, either in high school or starting college, you're so right in pointing out that, you know, even in our most vulnerable moments, we were, our questions were around orthopraxy. Yeah. You know, the, the oft-repeated, you know, question at conferences about, you know, eating gelatin and meat and gelatin I, and listening to gelatin? music, <laughs> listening to music and, 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 and yeah. Yeah, dealing with the opposite right. gender. Yeah. This is orthopraxy. And yeah. now we are dealing with sort of real uh, existential questions. Yeah. The that spiritual are crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Wow. yeah right. It is. So like at Zaytuna, for example, I mean, you know, in some of the work in the courses that you teach, um, you know, do you encounter those type of conversations with some of the students that yeah, I that think it's come, a, that it, come to Zaytuna? It's important for us to yeah. to equip them with how to deal with the world, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you know, Sheikh Hamza always talks about you know becoming intellectual warriors, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 that's where it has to be. We, this you know, it's it's a it's a battleground of ideas. You know, but we have certain things, we have certain parameters in our quote unquote rules of engagement. You know, um, we, we have to, you know, we have to not breach adab with people. And at the end of the day, it's beautiful. Lakum dina kum I mean, there was an anti Muslim polemicist one time mm -hmm. who said that the, he said the most, the, uh, the most tolerant verse he's ever read in any scripture is in a surah called Al Kathirun. The, you know, Infidels, yes, right. word, which is a Latin word, but lakum dina kum You have your way, and I have my way. Wow. It's there's there's a lot of profundity in that statement. That you know that we can have a dialogue, and this is what this is what college was intended for. Really, yeah. is to is to sit down and you know um, engage in a Socratic type of discourse where you're teasing out the truth, and if you agree to disagree, then that's fine. But nowadays, it's becoming an echo chamber. Students are just hearing, you know, what they want to hear. Their feelings are totally coddled. You know, it's it's the um, it's the environment of you know microaggressions and safe spaces. If you hear something that is 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 offensive to you, then you know, then you know, it's 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 something that uh, is is problematic and mm -hmm. and must be stopped and. You know, I just I just think it's uh, it's the wrong way of doing college. I mean, uh, this should be a place where there it's it's literally an intellectual battleground where you can actually hear things and develop refutations, mm. and you can you know hash things out in a civilized way. And at the end of the day, if you don't agree, lakum dina kum You have your religion, you have your beliefs or lack thereof, and so do I. Mm. Right. Um, so. Uh, it, it, I think that, that there's, a, there's a great lesson to that, to that ayah in the Qur'an. And I think students should know that just because you're at these institutions, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean that you should feel compelled to adopt uh, their way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, their way of thinking is, I mean, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a contradiction anyway. I mean, there's no, there's no absolute truth except the, 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 the fact that there's no absolute truth, right? It, just, it doesn't make any sense. Right. They're not bothered by contradictions uh, because they're not, they're not worried about logic. Um, but 
yeah, I mean, students at Zaytuna. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what they're going to be doing in a few years. I mean, the college is still relatively Correct. You know, young, and um, we started 2009. So, I mean, some of these students, I think, have an incredible potential to make massive impact mm. uh, on the world. Right. In, in a very, very positive way, hmm. as, as, as champions of, of Abrahamic theology and morality, which is so missing and so under attack right now, as literally being, um, you know, <coughs> depicted as the enemy of humanity, mm-hmm. you know. Now, unlike maybe, like, academia at large, I mean, there's probably not the, you know, publish or perish sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, pressure on you, but I, I do hope that you know, there is some writing in store mm-hmm. for you, and, or you're working on some things that maybe yeah. address some of these issues yeah, we'll in see. a more academic, nuanced fashion? Inshallah, yeah. That's, uh, my, you know, like I said, I turned 40, so this, this is the decade, I think, where I'm going to start writing more, maybe publish a few things. Right. And, you know, I don't want to make the same mistakes of the past. So, <laughs> uh, inshallah, yeah, I think, I, think there, I think we have to have sure. a, a very strong... Um, uh, uh, intellectual sort of, um, uh, what's the word to use? Foundation of literature, I guess you right. could say, to address all of these issues. That's right. From a confessional, traditional perspective. Hmm. You know? That's right. That's right. Well, I think that's a yeah. good place to wrap up this conversation. Any, yeah, we covered a lot of ground. Oh my that's goodness. Right. Yeah. Where, where can people uh, seek you out, find out information or about you, maybe engage you? Uh, do they want to learn more? Any uh, online sources that people can tap into? Not, <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of things on YouTube that people okay. have posted. Yes. Um, I would just recommend watching, I did a talk on postmodernism a few weeks ago uh, um, at uh, MCC in Dublin. Correct. So uh, if you search on YouTube, I, I, I checked out the videos. It was, uh, it was wonderful. Uh, if you check out uh, MCC East Bay, uh, do a search for that and then Dr. Ali Atai's name. Yeah. That's um, A T A. I, I, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and so, uh, and, and we'll try to maybe link to, to yeah. some of those videos, but that yeah. one in particular, I think, it was over an hour. It was, it was, it was wonderful. So I think. So that, after you listen to this, <laughs> yeah, on. there you go. Um, yeah, I'm not, but, on, I'm not on social media, okay. so I kind of fly under the radar, but, yeah. and I have my reasons for that. But yeah, check out that talk. I, I did a few lectures at Zaytuna for people that are interested in, in comparative theology, comparative religion. I did one on the Prophet Sallallahu in the biblical text. Uh, and then another one on uh, on is uh, God Allah, which is um, also you'll find that on, on YouTube if you search for it. Mm. And then can people, if people are in, if communities are invited or interested in inviting you out or anything, I mean, do you, you, you accept Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. Is there somewhere where people can go for that? Or? You have handlers, or do you kind of take care of that yourself? <laughs> no, I just it's just me. Okay, okay. So there maybe an email I mean, I mean, certainly or, people yeah. can email. Yeah, yeah, if you go to zaytuna.edu, you'll find my my profile there. And so people can contact you there. Yeah, definitely. Yes, people do that. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Atai. I mean, this has been wonderful, and uh, uh, you're right here. You're, you're practically a neighbor, so we want to, you know, inshallah, hopefully have we, you out we, again. We will have you back, inshallah. We have to inshallah. continue that's this right, conversation. That's right. Um, and so before we wrap, I, I also want to just, again, make a plug for our Patreon page. I know people have been going there and becoming um, supporters of the show. Uh, we're still uh, a little bit away from where our target was, but people have been uh, almost monthly still continuing to join. And so if you're a listener, if you benefit at all from the show, you enjoy the show, enjoy the content we produce, even if it's a dollar a month, if it's five dollars a month, whatever you're comfortable doing, go to patreon.com slash diffuse congruence and become a patron of the show. We would really, really appreciate it. And Zaki, maybe you can close this out by telling us, telling our listeners where people can find us. Yeah, you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can also hit like on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Also, please go to iTunes and leave a review, leave a star rating, and let us know what you think. And every review that you leave helps spread the word. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you to our guest, Dr. Ali Atai. On behalf of my partner, Pervez Ahmed, this is Zaki Hassan. Thank you so much for listening. Catch you next time.